Good afternoon. My name is Richard Cummings, and it's a pleasure to me, for me to speak on behalf of the NIH Common Fund uh, Glycoscience Program today. I want to talk to you today about a project that we've been working on entitled Smart Anti-Glycan Reagents to Generate the Human Glycome Atlas. Uh, and I'll tell you about what these words mean, what the Smart Anti-Glycan Reagent is, and what the Human Glycome Atlas is. I first want to just mention some of our key project team members that worked on what I'm going to talk about today. And they are listed here as Tanya McKittrick, uh, Chris Goff, uh, Jamie Heimberg Molinaro, Alyssa McQuilla, Rosalia Falco, Brant Heron, and Max Cooper. So first let's talk about glycans and what glycans are and how they're expressed in the human body. Glycans are collections of monosaccharides that create a molecule that we used to call, or can sometimes call, an oligosaccharide or a polysaccharide. Today we'll just use the word glycan to represent any kind of construct of molecules that are made of sugars. Now on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see the word glycans. And these little symbols for each one of these molecules incorporates squares and circles and diamonds and different colors. And each one of those represent a different monosaccharide. The human body is built of basically 10 building blocks that make up the glycome, and that is the collection of all the glycans in the human body. And they're assembled in different ways by sets of enzymes. These glycans are often attached to proteins or lipids. They can occur free in the body, as in milk and some bodily fluids, but mostly they're attached to proteins and lipids. Now, individual glycoproteins, shown in this uh, illustration, could have different glycans on them. So each glycoprotein could have a different assortment of glycans on it. The human body is comprised of many, many thousands of glycoproteins. And we anticipate that there are many, many tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of different glycans. Now these individual glycoproteins are also expressed by individual cells. The human body is comprised of over 200 known cell types. Uh, nerve cells, muscle cells, fibroblasts, chondrocytes, etc. Each one of these cells have different glycoproteins. They have different glycans. So the cell types, as they're called, all differ in their glycome and that collection of glycans that they have. But then you have the tissue itself, which is comprised of all the cells that create a tissue. So the tissue itself is unique in its own glycome because it may be very different. Uh, and then they create, from these tissues, you create organs, the liver, the lung, the brain, the heart, so forth, and so forth. And that makes up the organism. Now, I depicted a kind of an embryo here because from this embryo, we then develop into a full-fledged adult, a mature body. And throughout development, even, of the human being and of any animal, the, there are changes in the glycans that occur during this time. So what we talk about then is the spatial and temporal expression. That is, where they're expressed and when they're expressed. All these thousands and thousands of glycans on thousands and thousands of glycoproteins in many human cell types and so forth. So right off, you might know that uh, the human genome, which is the DNA that makes up all our cells and the information content of our nuclei, is, is very complex. But unfortunately, you may not know that the glycome is much more complex than the genome. It's spatially and temporally regulated in their glycans and things that we don't know what they are. So I've depicted here the analytical ease, you might say. Uh, the ability to define something is easiest on the right-hand side of this slide, where you have simple glycans, you might call them simple, versus an organism, which is really complex and very difficult to analyze. So we've been working on developing new tools, and here we call them smart anti-glycan reagents. Now these are reagents that recognize specific features of a glycan, and they're smart because they recognize very unique, very specific things in a glycan structure. So that way, we abbreviate them in SAGRs, S-A-G-R-S. And SAGRs are smart anti-glycan reagents. And they're really kind of antibodies. In our case, they're based on antibodies made in a fish. Now, antibodies have been around since the early 1970s. Caesar Milstein invented the concept of monoclonal antibodies in mice by over 40 years ago now. 
And those monoclonal antibodies are depicted here in this slide uh, as an immunoglobulin, for example, an IgG. Um, you could have a small version of that that's called a single chain uh, fragment, FV. Well, we've also found that other animals, not humans, not mice, also make a lot of antibodies, and some of those are camelid antibodies made in, you might guess, camels. And animals like a camel, like a llama. So camelids, SCFVs, and monoclonal antibodies are the, typically the three major types of monoclonal antibodies that have been used historically in the field of science since the 1970s. Now, we've been working on the SAGERs, which are uh, antibodies made in the fish called the lamprey. And they are called lamprey variable lymphocyte receptors B, from a, like a B cell. We have B cells, T cells, different blood cells, and so does the lamprey. And I'll come back to that in a minute, what the lamprey really is. But the other reagents that we use in this field are lectins, which are plant-derived often, and sometimes animal-derived, and sometimes bacterially derived. And their lectins are proteins in nature that can just naturally bind sugar. Antibodies, in contrast, are things that are induced by the introduction of an antigen. And so the animal makes an antibody in response to the antigen that you gave it. Now the VLRBs, these antibodies made in the lamprey, are very different in structure from the antibodies made in all other animals on Earth. And that's because the lamprey uh, evolutionarily separated uh, that whole lineage of animals, separated over 500 million years ago from the lineage that gave rise to human beings and the, and the primates. So the fish, these tiny fish that have no jaw, they're not like regular fish. They are jawless vertebrates. The lamprey uh, lives as a, as a parasitic fish, actually. It's in the Great Lakes. So we recover the lampreys, little larvae lampreys, tiny fish from the Great Lakes, Lake Michigan, in fact. And this protein, once it folds up and is made by the lamprey to make an antibody, this is the antibody that it makes to an antigen, you can see it's very complex structure shown in, the, in this diagram on the left side. And, and on the right side, it shows how it binds antigens and it shows two different angles of this antibody from one side and a 90 degree turn, another side. And that shows here in this left-handed structure where the antigen binds. The antigen is defined as a thing recognized by an antibody. Now, I'm going to explain this in the next few slides, but let's start with this slide, where I'm going to illustrate here on this slide on the left, a yeast. Well, I haven't mentioned anything about yeast yet. What do yeast have to do with making lamprey antibodies? Well, when the lamprey makes an antibody, it expresses that antibody in its B cells, the tiny cells that are circulating in its blood. So after we've determined that the lamprey has made an antibody to the antigens that we've immunized it with, and I'll explain that in the next slide, we then take those proteins and the genes encoding those proteins and express them in a yeast. And each individual yeast then expresses a different antibody. And the yeast permanently express those antibodies from now and forever. So each yeast is a different, unique um, an organism making a unique antibody that was derived from the lamprey. So that's called heterologous expression. You take the DNA from one animal and express it in another organism and that's called heterologous expression. So we do heterologous expression of the, of the DNA encoding the antibody from the lamprey into a yeast, and then we then take these yeasts and we can then incubate them with the antigen and isolate the yeast that bind to the antigen. And therefore, then we have the purified yeast that make an antibody to that antigen. And now this is all cloned, it's all molecular, did not involve a mouse, it did not involve a hybridoma, as you use in mouse hybridoma technology. It's all cloned now. The entire library of all the antibodies that this lamprey has ever made and ever will make have all been cloned now into a yeast expression library permanently. So these antibodies will never be lost. The DNA will never be lost. We have it permanently recorded. And we sequenced all the antibodies now. So we express this protein uh, eventually as a recombinant protein. And now it's not made in yeast anymore. Now it's made in a third heterologous system, a mammalian cell, that is good at making antibodies, mammalian antibodies. And that's called the recombinant protein here. Now we can take those VLRs that are attached to an antibody, a human antibody in fact now, and that's called a chimera. And we can take those and screen them on tissue and find out what they bind to and what tissues they bind to. Now this slide depicts our strategy. 
So up there at the top of this slide is a little tiny larvae of lamprey. And it's only about three to four inches long. They live for years, so we collect them and have fish tanks at Harvard Medical School where we are located. And those fish tanks uh, have many, many hundreds of these uh, fish there. We collect a few of them, immunize them, put them back in a new tank, and wait for them to make antibody. Once we then take one or two of these animals and sacrifice them and screen for their sera, do they have antibodies made against the original antigen? Now, the immunization can be anything. We can immunize with cells. We can immunize with ground up tissue, homogenates of tissue, individual glycoproteins, even individual glycans, just free in solution. We've actually also immunized the lamprey with human milk and made antibodies to all the carbohydrates in human milk. Now, once we make those uh, uh, antibodies and the lamprey is positive, as I said, we then take all the B cells, the lymphocytes out of that lamprey, and make a yeast surface display library called the, the YSD that I talked about on the last slide. Then we can screen this library for the binding to antigens. We can use flow, flow cytometry, fluorescence-activated cell sorting. We can use many other displays of carbohydrates on beads. Um, and we can enrich for the yeast that bind to the antigens. And then we can take this DNA encoding the antigenic properties of that antibody I showed you a while ago in another slide and fuse it to a immun human immunoglobulin and only the back end part of the immunoglobulin so that we have a chimera. So now we have a human-like IgG that's expressed in the lamprey antibody on its, on its surface. And that's called the chimeric, BLRBFC. Now those are useful reagents because every antibody now has the exact same structure except for the variable domain that binds the antigen. Now currently that's really not true if you make monoclonal antibodies in, a, in, in animals. You have many kinds of antibodies. You may have IgM or IgA or IgG and many kinds of IgGs. So currently in the field of immunology, we are faced with all kinds of different types of antibodies. But the antibodies we make are all of one type. They all have the exact same structure except for the part of it that binds the antigen. And that is uh, really an important uh, distinction of the smart anti-glycan reagents, the SAGERs that I'm talking about today. Now, we have glycans that have been attached to all kinds of things to test for antibodies that bind to glycans. And one of the best things that we have are glycan microarrays. Now, let me explain what a microarray is for a moment. A microarray is an actual glass slide like you had in high school biology class. It's exactly like that slide. And on that slide are printed many thousands of tiny spots that are basically invisible to the eye. And these spots are microscopic spots. Each one of them have only one nanogram, one billionth of a gram of sugar in each spot. Now, if an antibody binds to a, that sugar on some spot or other, we can detect it with a reagent that recognizes an antibody, like I told you. Now we have all the antibodies that are exactly the same except for the part that binds the antigen. So we have a secondary reagent that can detect the binding of an IgG. And as you take this naive, so-called naive, serum from a naive lamprey that's never been immunized with, with, with antigens, uh, you can see that the serum of the lamprey has nothing that binds. Now, in this case, we're detecting the actual lamprey antibodies in the lamprey serum itself. And if we immunize and take the, the lamprey antibodies from immunization with B cells, human B cells, by the way, you see all kinds of antibodies that bind sugar in the second slide B, in the second uh, graph B. If you look in C, pig lung, homogenates, homogenates of pig lung were used to immunize the lamprey. Then human breast milk, I mentioned a while ago. Uh, Pro minus five Cho cells, Chinese hamster ovary cells. Lec eight, a mutant of Chinese hamster ovary cells. Lec eight GT, another mutant that we created of Chinese hamster ovary cells. It makes different sugars. And then Lec eight GTFT, another mutant still that we made that expresses even different sugars on its surface. As you can see, all these cells that we immunize with induce antibodies in the lamprey, and the pattern that you see before you is different for every immunogen. That means we've made a large library of antibodies now against all those antigens. And this just shows if you take the yeast itself and compare it to the recombinant antibody and actually put the yeast on the microarray, the little tiny spots I mentioned, on the bright field microscope slide there, you can see the yeast actually binding. There are 
many hundreds of yeast binding to each spot. And the way we printed this array is every spot there has the exact same sugar in it. So this is one yeast making one kind of antibody and it binds to the 10 different spots there. Equivalently, pretty equivalently, because all the spots have about the same exact amount of sugar. And if, if you see a fluorescent image, because all the, uh, the uh, yeasts are also green, by the way, we label them so that they express the green fluorescent protein. So the yeasts actually are fluorescent, unlike normal yeast. So we can easily see the yeast binding to an array. We can easily see that the VLRB recombinant antibodies, so VLRB FCs, is exactly the same as the yeast themselves from which that antibody was derived. Now again, this shows that we've made a very specific antibody here against the H antigen. The H antigen is a major blood group antigen in all people. Almost all people on earth contain the H antigen on their red blood cells. So whenever you get uh, into the hospital and they do your blood type and ask you what is your blood type, you may be A, B, O. O is actually the H antigen. So everyone has O and people may have A or B or both. So here we've made an antibody in Lamprey against the H antigen. And the H antigen, shown here and named, is defined as a fucose, which is in a red triangle, <laughs> linked to a galactose, which is a yellow circle, linked to a blue square, which is N-acetylglucosamine. And that's a trisaccharide. As you can see, the antibody that we've made against the H antigen binds to every single glycan on our array that has that antigen. This is the most specific antibody we've, we've seen when we started this work. It recognizes a unique, very specific antigen and will not bind to any isomer that we can make of that antigen. And again, it shows the yeast binding uh, to the slide on the left. Now we can also enrich for these libraries. Sometimes you've immunized with very complex tissue and it may have thousands of different carbohydrate antigens and some may be really minor, very minor. And you may not see them initially, but if you're screening for them, you may want to enrich for them. So you might take a very minor antigen, minor sugar, and, you, and believe it or not, you don't even have to know what it is. You just have to know that it's minor. You attach that to a bead, and then you start enriching for yeast that bind to that bead that has that sugar on it, called the glycan antigen. So you can keep enriching for yeast that bind to these very minor antigens, and eventually, after one cell sorting, two cell sortings, you keep enriching, you eventually get yeast that really make a lot of antibody to that very minor antigen. <clears throat> this just shows how we've done that. We've enriched even with intact cells. We don't always have to use beads because red blood cells are kind of like a bead already. They're covered with sugar, and each red blood cell of every animal species on Earth has different sugars on it, by the way. So the red blood cells of a turkey is very different from the red blood cells of a guinea pig and red blood cells of a human being. And I say turkey and guinea pig and human beings because all those cells are used currently to study the binding of human influenza viruses that bind to different carbohydrates on different animal species cells. And the easiest cells to obtain are the red blood cells of different animals. But all those animals make different glycans. So how is it possible that the yeast I mean, that the red blood cells can bind to different influenza viruses. Well, they don't often. So there are many influenza viruses that don't bind to certain red cells and not others, and do bind to others. So in this way, we've used red blood cells to enrich, you might say, for all kinds of antibodies uh, that are specific to even the red blood cell and don't react with any other cell, by the way. Not even a red blood cell of another animal. Now, this just shows kind of a, the number of libraries of antibodies that we have. You probably never have heard this before. It's never been done before. Libraries of actual antibodies. <laughs> libraries mean they're cloned, recombinant, uh, sequenced proteins and genes, encoding those proteins. And you can see we've immunized in this short little list here, this is only about half of the things that we've done. Human erythrocytes, influenza viruses, SIV particles, blood-brain barrier cells. Uh, wow, the diversity is unbelievable because we can immunize with anything. And by the way, the immunization does not require an adjuvant. Usually if you immunize a rabbit or you immunize a mouse, you might need to have the antigen in association with an adjuvant, something that boosts the immunity. But we really don't have to worry about that with the lamprey. We can inject the antigens directly without adjuvants. Now we've sequenced a lot of these antibodies, uh, the genes encoding these antibodies, I should say. Now that's very unusual. Uh, you won't find too many sequences in the literature of monoclonal antibodies they usually are not available. 
Uh, people re make recombinant antibody often, but not usually. They use a hybridoma, that is an, a, a cell that produces the antibody. And most people don't know what the sequence of the antibody is. Now that's led to lots of problems in the reproducibility of science because we buy antibodies and people have them available, but we don't know what their sequences are. So they may not be replicable. Maybe I can't get that antibody again. So as a new reagent like this, we've decided to make all the amino acid sequences of the antibodies publicly available. And therefore anyone can make the same antibody that we have and replicate all the results that we've gotten with this antibody. But here it shows the sequence of several of these antibodies, and their names are things on the left there at the top, like TN4-28, TN4-21, etc. Sorry for those kind of common laboratory names, but that's how they get named as we keep selecting clones and so forth. So all these antibodies, as you can see, have some amino acids in common and some that are not in common. Wherever there's a dotted line, that means they're identical. And wherever an amino acid is different, that's shown as the named amino acid, Q or W or N or S or whatever. And so you can see that those residues uh, that are colored are the ones that we've actually done crystal structure with. These antibodies are very easy to crystallize with the antigen. So we've identified in many cases the amino acids that make contact with the sugar itself. Now that's a very unique thing, I should uh, reinforce that about lamprey antibodies, that they're very easy to crystallize because they themselves, as much as I like glycoproteins, they are not glycoproteins. They have no sugars attached to them, they have no modifications themselves. So they're very tiny little proteins that are easily crystallizable and can easily be co-crystallized with the carbohydrate antigens. Now again, we've looked at many different kinds of uh, antibodies made in the lamprey, but we wanted to compare just to see what's the difference if we immunize a lamprey versus immunizing a mouse with the same material. So here we immunize a mouse with different erythrocytes. Unfortunately, we had to use adjuvants for that in the mouse with type O erythrocytes or type AB erythrocytes, erythrocytes or a simian uh, virus called SIV. Now, as we immunize the mouse, we get IgMs, murine IgMs or murine IgGs, and we immunize the lamprey with the same material without an adjuvant, and that's looking at the VLRBs, as we'll call them, the antibodies in the lamprey serum or plasma. As you can see, with the same immunogen, we get antibodies made in the mouse also, that they're all IgM. We didn't get any IgG type antibodies made in the mouse with this immunization. But in the lamprey, wow, we got a robust amount of antibodies in the plasma of the lampreys. So this means now, for us, we no longer use mice in our work. So no vertebrates are used to make these antibodies, and only the lamprey is used. No, no uh, mammals, I mean. We only use lamprey. Now, we've looked at many different antibodies, and uh, these are some of them that are named here. Uh, TN4-11, TN4-14. Each one binds a different uh, antigen, and each one binds a different antigen on our glycan microarray. In some of those, we've identified exactly what the epitope is, and some we're still working on it. But the epitopes are kind of listed down below. Some of them are sialic acid containing that have that red uh, diamond. Some of them have fucose, which is the red triangle. Some of them have sulfate, called SUL. Some of them have terminal N-acetyl glucosamine, called uh, in, the, in the blue square, and so forth. Each antibody recognizes a different antigen. Now these antibodies can also be, as I said, expressed as chimeric proteins with an IgG kind of structure, so they're easy to use in Western blot. They can be used to detect antigens by all the common methods that scientists use, flow cytometry, Western blotting, and this just shows uh, antibodies that bind glycoproteins on a Western blot like transferrin or fetuin, and this antibody will not bind if the salic acid is removed from these proteins, and that's called neuraminidase plus or minus. So as you can see in the western blot there on the right hand side, after neuraminidase, the antibody does not bind the sugars, or the sialic acid, on those glycoproteins. Other antigens and antibodies we know also bind in glycans, and I'll just illustrate that with VLRB 0-6, that if you treat the glycoproteins with an PNGase L that removes the N glycans, the antibody no longer binds. So it detects N glycan epitopes. Uh, so simple little methods like this can be used to quickly identify 
what glycoproteins in the human body, what glycoproteins in animals are recognized by our antibodies and are they in-linked antibodies? Are they terminal sugars and uh, in in-linked glycans? Are they terminal sugars and so forth? Now, one of the most important antibodies that we've found and we've been studying lately, believe it or not, is an antibody to a sulfated galactose. This sulfated galactose at the three position of galactose shown there on the right, this antibody is incredibly specific for this determinant. And we found many glycoproteins and glycolipids that have this determinant. In fact, we've discovered that this antigen, sulfated galactose, is expressed on unique glycoproteins in the human body. It's expressed in various ways, both on N-glycans, on glycolipids, and in some cases on O-glycans. Its expression is incredibly important, we think. So we're trying now to develop more understanding of the expression of this antigen, which we had not ever analyzed before. This structure is almost never analyzed in the field of glycomics, looking at human tissue, because it wasn't really known to be there. Now, the conclusions I'm going to give you today from all this work is that we've developed a very efficient method to develop these smart anti-glycan reagents, SAGERs, using immunization in lampreys. We've also further developed all kinds of methods to conjugate uh, antigens to fix jerkat cells, which are human T cells just to enhance their expression on the jerkat cells so we can do sorting and optimize antibody production in many ways. We've also successfully produced a yeast surface display library and selection technologies that I talked to you about earlier. We've also been able to produce these chimeric antibodies that have human immunoglobulin domains associated with the antigen recognition domain of the lamprey. And we've also developed a whole suite of these SAGERs to a variety of glycan antigens, including sialic acid itself, believe it or not, uh, sulfated sugars, blood group antigens, et cetera, et cetera. We've demonstrated that these SAGERs can be used in Western blotting, immunoprecipitation, pull-down experiments, conventional cell biology type work, immunohistochemistry, uh, in every conventional way that you've ever imagined that you could use an antibody, these SAGERs can be used in that way. So I'm very uh, proud of the work we've done and our team to develop these very unique reagents. Uh, the sequences of all the antibodies that I've talked to you about today will be available publicly. Uh, and the, anyone then can express these antibodies. You could also request that our laboratory send you the cDNAs or the sequences of these antibodies and we'd be glad to share all the information that we've obtained in the spirit of the Common Fund where we're all trying to develop reagents in the field of glycoscience that would help us solve the problem of the spatial and temporal expression of glycans in animal and human bodies. Thank you.